Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode here on I've Got 10, where I'm spending time with some of the amazing coaches and consultants that are part of the Dental Consultant Connection. As many of you have been watching week after week, I've been bringing on one a week and having them share some tips for the startup practices, but also the seasoned practices. It's 2019. Everybody's kind of regaging where they're at and how they want to grow their practice. So very, very honored this morning to bring on an industry leader when it comes to dental practice management and advisory and all of that. Christine Berry, how you doing, Christine? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited this morning. I'm ready to go. I had lots of coffee. <laughs> lots of coffee. We're up early. Thank you so much yes. for, for joining us. All right. So before we get into things, um, you know, maybe we'll just have you kind of talk a little bit about uh, your theme. And we're just going to take, you know, 10 to 12 minutes, what have you, and try to hit on some some key points that practices can look at more along the lines of where you focus with your teams when it comes to whether they're either a startup practice or season practice. So the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. And I want to thank Robin for putting this all together. It's 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 fantastic being able to um, listen to other consultants and have us all be together in a community. So I'm really, I'm really privileged about being involved. So today I wanted to talk about retention and recruitment. And the reason why I bring this to light is because I work with a lot of offices and they have open positions. And whether it's in one location or multiple locations. And if you kind of take a look at what's happening in the economy with the, um, the economy is kind of on the rise and the GDP 3% over year over year. So that's growing. So theoretically, there's more money to spend in, in dental. Hopefully there's discretionary income as well as the unemployment rate. And we have to take that into consideration. So we're moving into an economy for a few years that team members um, may have more of an upper hand. So from a practice owner and an organization perspective, if the question is, what are we doing to not only attract, um, I was going to say patients, team members, and then what are we doing to keep them? And so I do have some five tips that I would like to just kind of go through, and hopefully that'll be, you know, advantageous to the audience. Awesome. All right. Let's start with number one. So number one deals with um, culture and what is your brand? You know, what's the secret sauce of your practice? And at this point, I don't want anyone to like roll their eyes and say, oh, she's starting with culture because I really want them to, I really want you to challenge you and, and challenge the listeners out there and, and owners of practices. Because if you're looking at the changing demographics, if you're looking at the variety of generations working in dental practices, if you're looking at the research between, you know, the masculine energy and the, uh, the feminine energy, when the leadership perspective, um, you have to approach culture and mission and the purpose, the why, right? So younger people are really into the why of their organization. So it's really important to figure out not only from a owner perspective, why are you doing what you're doing, right, number one, but then go departmentally. Do you have a hygiene department? And that hygiene department could be a hygienist of one. Does he or she have a mission statement? Do your dental assistants have one? Do your admin team, your administration team have one? And do we all know what it is? Now, obviously, it should trickle down, um, but it all needs to have communication. So it's, it's really important that way. And I share that with you because we all know that when we're attracting, we want to have team members apply. There's like this secret hidden network within clinical providers, because I'm a hygienist, that in any area, we know what offices we're going to apply to and what offices we're not going to apply to. So that's a fact. And so if off and administrators aren't recognizing that, if they're swimming in their own pool forever and not kind of trying to take their blinders off to what the perception is of their practice in the community, that's going to hit them hard as far as if they're not getting those positions filled or if those people are coming, but they're not staying. So perception, perception is reality. So quick things that you can do with that would be survey, have exit interviews of your team members. And if it's a small community and you don't feel comfortable doing that, you know, work with a consultant who can help you with that. Everyone wants to have more patients, new patients. What are you doing when patients leave your practice? Are you talking to them? Are you finding out? Are you collecting that data so you can actually find out what themes are, are coming up again and again? And then your current team members, as well as your current patients, survey them, find out what their secret sauce, um, this, your secret sauce is in their perceptions because it may be totally different so number one definitely find out you know clean up your own brand 
find out your own why, communicate your why. Um, and that was just one. So um, actually, the number two, I kind of touched base on it before. Please share it. Have the team members own it, right? So make sure they they believe it. Have them have it be fluid. Don't just put it up on the wall and never look at it again. And it's something that should be a, a fluid document that everyone wants to communicate. And it should be part of the framework to each one of your team meetings, whether you have your team meetings weekly or quarterly. And then um, second thing, a third thing, you should take a look at what performance metrics do you have? What key performance indicators do you have for your team? Yes, some of you have job descriptions, or if you don't have job descriptions, but you want, what do you want to hold your team accountable for? And make sure that's very clear. So you're gonna have performance metrics. Um, individual eyes, again, based on each position and what that position needs to have, all in service to the mission, all in service to your patients. And then something, John, that I'm really passionate about the past couple years is having a code of conduct having a code of performance. And really, again, it all trickles down from your culture and your mission statement. But what I'm finding, and, and I'm sure you're seeing it too in some of the um, articles and the Facebook case, um, pages, but there are some people in dentistry who aren't very nice. you know. And so you walk into that environment and whatever that position is, from the owner to the administrative person to the dental assistant, they're not happy people and they have very aggressive personalities. And so some people like to call them bullies or some people like to label them with all kinds of crazy things. But for me and from a coaching perspective, I don't want to label. I, I'm not a person who labels because I believe that people can change. And so if you have an aggressive personality um, and you're in a practice and other people know that yeah, this person probably has blinders on, they don't realize their perceptions of, of what their, their actions are having an effect on other people. So let's bring this back to center. Let's set up a code of conduct and let's make sure that it's difference between having what's civil conversation and then what's really more aggressive mm -hmm. and angry conversations and how do you mediate that? And it's, if you just, if the person is value and they have a lot of intellectual capital and they've been with you for a long time, you don't necessarily want to get rid of them. And how amazing it would be, and how amazing it is when I work with offices who do this, is that the company itself, if they take the time to invest in that particular employee and have them understand how their behavior is affecting everyone around them, and that behavior changes, you have a loyal employee for life. Everyone around you realizes that, oh my gosh, he or she finally realizes that she's been destructive but they invested in that person. So everyone else around them is happy. and It's a win-win situation. And that's about, you know, retention and recruitment. So it's, it's what can we do with the key team players that we have? Now, I, I often kind of be a little bit tongue in cheek. If this aggressive person or this person who's very disruptive, if they're not bringing value to your organization, then that's another route, right? So that's a conversation that you need to have with them. Probably like shouldn't be there. But a lot of times what you find is when you start from the top with your culture and your mission and your mission and you're living it, living it every day, the people who aren't in alignment with it, they're gonna leave anyway. So from my passive aggressive owners out there who don't want to fire anyone, you know, perhaps it's it, you don't necessarily have to worry about that. And then lastly, which is again, I'm gonna throw this a little bit, step on some toes, it's holding people accountable. Right, so it's getting a system in place. You have these wonderful systems in place for their performance, for their conduct, hold them accountable to the culture, and you just need to make sure that you have those conversations. We all have bad days, and we can all go back to center, but what I'm finding a lot of time is that accountability piece. That, you know, oh, I did that. I did a mission statement a couple of years ago, and we had a team meeting. Oh, that's great, so what are we doing now in place to, uphold that and when someone kind of you know steps out of um, bounds and, and is not you know working in the environment or, or working the behavior that you want for your patients how are you holding them accountable so those are the areas that it's quick it's top shelf um, that you could dig deeper each one could be totally a long conversation but for me and to try to help to have these offices have those amazing um, employees and attract amazing employees we have to start doing something a little bit different and that's going outside the normal just putting an ad in 
we have to start with looking within the organization, what's the personality of the organization, and what's the various personalities, and what we're giving off to the community. So that's kind of the things that I wanted to share this morning. Well, I love that. There's one in particular that I wanted to hit on, which I think the whole conduct piece is very is very fascinating, right? Because Christine, you've been doing this for a long time and working with yeah. dental practices. And my question is, is as you know, people are people, right? People were people in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and now in the 2000s. Like the basic fundamentals of people don't change. It just seems like all of the new uh, things that have happened in dentistry, technology, more more practices, more demands from patients has obviously required everybody to step up their game on, on the people side. And I think yeah. that's what's so important about the work that you do. And that's why I was so excited about this podcast series, because I think that what we're seeing in the industry is almost like this move back to basics, like these right. basic things, like, you know, people would like, like you, you started with culture and it's interesting yep. how people kind of, you know, do that tongue in cheek, but you're so right. I mean, when you look at some of the top performing companies in the world, and I know you see this and deal with this all the time, it's a big piece, but also on the conduct side. And, and, and I'm curious from your perspective, why do you think some of those practices that maybe get stuck in their bubble and they haven't realized that they have to be nice? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, from your experience, what, how does it get like that? Is it just years and years of maybe doing what you always did and that worked and therefore you thought things were okay and then and then all of a sudden, you know, the world changed? Well, actually, yes and no. So for someone who, let's face it, for working for a, a clinical dental hygienist or a doctor or a surgeon or anyone who has high technical skill, skill and high intelligence, right? So they have this level of knowledge and they also have they want to be competent, right? They want to be seen as competent, right? So what happens is a lot of times when you have a little bit more of those aggressive personalities, they, they it's the hyper competence that comes in that if anything in their world, in their perception, right? Again, perception is key, that if they perceive anyone to be the weak link, anyone's going to cause you didn't mount that x-ray right, or you didn't set this tray up right. And and so they're going to get upset because they feel that it's going to affect their ability to do the level of care that they want to. And this research, again, not just in dentistry, it's, it's touching bit dentistry, but a lot in the medical world as right. far as with, you know, we've always heard those stories about, you know, brilliant surgeons, but their bedside manner. So, but in dentistry, it's a relationship based um, uh, profession. So what's happening is too, is that again, it's, it's not necessarily new, but if you can't keep a team member, if you, if you have a revolving door in the front office or your staff, look within well, what's happening. Now, why is it like that? A lot of it comes to um, interpersonal skills and emotional intelligence. And so it's, it's, again, it's just everyone's evolution. It's your culture. It's what part of the country you were brought up. It's the education you experienced. It's your family unit. I mean, your family unit is your first business that you ever belong to. So all those factors are going to interplay with who we are. And, and, and so because I hear so often, well, my dad treated me like that, or, or why should I coddle them? And they know what's going on. It doesn't necessarily work like that. If it works for you, then that's great. But if, if you're finding some little bit of, um, pitfalls in, in your team members, then, you know, the place is to start with yourself. And a lot of times when I work with offices too, I'll talk to it with the doctor and it may not, it's, it may not be the doctor, it's the office manager right. and she knows everything. And so I don't want her to go. And, and so that's two conversations. Number one, why does she have everything in her head and not done in checklists and systems? That's a different kind of conversation. But number two, if you value her, if you've been in a relationship with her for 20 years, invest in her and, and this type of coaching and behavioral change I'm just about sitting on the couch right I'm, not, I'm talking about years and years of therapy and, and peeling back the layers that's not what coaching is about it's identifying their motivators do they want to change and most people want to change because they want to stay employed um, and then you just kind of walk them through that process and like I said they're highly competent intelligent people if they want they get it I mean it doesn't take many sessions to be able to you know take those blinders off so it's, it's, it's a lot of different things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great question. Well, thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah, I've got up on the screen right now. Okay. If you want to learn more about the great work that Christine's doing in the industry, uh, you, she's got her whole page. All of the team members at DCC have their own page up there. Very nicely done. Talks about what they do. Yes. A way to get in touch with them. I've got a phone number up on the screen, which you'll see if you want to go ahead and call uh, DCC to learn more about Christine. Yes, how, please how do. Practice. So we've got that up there. And, and as you can see, you know, 
it's it can be challenging to get all these team members. They're out all over the country traveling. Obviously, yeah. Christine's in the hotel room right now, and she was gracious <laughs> enough to get up early this morning. And they were like working with the lights and all that stuff. But I think, you know, I uh, what's so important is that uh, there are so many great people like Christine that are taking the time to make dentistry better. And, and again, super appreciate you coming on this morning and, and sharing just even just maybe one of those tips. If, you know, one dental practice sees that uh, could really make a difference with themselves, their teams, their community, all that great stuff. So yeah, Christine, absolutely. It's been, it's been a true pleasure. And um, we're going to go ahead. I want to let everybody know for each one of these video podcasts, we're also recording an audio podcast, uh, which will be up on iTunes uh, from the Digital Trade Show Dental Audio Podcast. We're going to learn a little bit more about Christine, a little bit more about her story, kind of where she came from and, and, and where how she got to where she is right now. So, Christine, happy Thursday morning, and thanks again. For thank you. On oh, thank you. I look forward to it. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.